Good afternoon, everyone. And a warm welcome to you all to this special event in the life of the Game Center for Christianity Worldwide, the CCCW Day. Those joining us in person here and those joining online from different parts of the world, a warm welcome to you all. For those joining our events for the first time, I am Muthuraj Swami, Director of CCCW. We celebrate CCCW Day in January every year to remember the moving of the Henry Martin Library from the Henry Martin Hall to the Westminster College and the official opening of the Henry Martin Center on 22nd January 1996, founded by Bishop Graham Kings, who is with us today. Since 2021, we have been celebrating this day with a seminar or lecture together, with, together also with our annual gathering in person and online of the Friends of CCCW. Welcome to all those who have become friends of the sender from around the world. We remain grateful to you for your prayers and support for the work of the sender. For those who want to join the Friends of CCCW scheme and support us, so here is a flyer which is um, uh, put in our seats. So please go through and uh, we'll be um, uh, very happy if you uh, get in touch with us. Those joining online, the link uh, will be put in the chat box and please uh, feel free to um, contact us uh, using the information there. So we are delighted to have with us Professor Emma Wildwood to deliver the CCCW Day Lecture for this year. Emma was my predecessor at CCCW and is now Professor of African Religions and World Christianity at the University of Edinburgh, where she's also co-director of the Center for the Study of World Christianity. Emma's research Focus, research focuses on religious encounter in East Central Africa, particularly Christian conversion and growth of mission initiated denominations between 1800 and the present day. The recent focus of her research is the intersection of health and faith in the region. She is currently working with the Congolese researchers on the intersection between faith and COVID-19 in Congo. Emma is widely published. So she is the author of several works, including the monograph, The Mission of Apollo Kheme Bulaya, Religious Encounter and Social Change in the Great Lakes, 1865 to 1935. Um, recent 2020 book, and also uh, the idea of migration and Christian identity in Congo, which was published by Brill. She's also editor or co-editor of a number of books, including the Archive of Ugandan, Ugandan Missionary, writings by and about Reverend Apollo Kaiwe Bulayan, and which was published by Oxford in 2022. And also, Relocating World Christianity, Interdisciplinary Studies in Universal and Local Expressions of Christian Faith, Brill uh, 2017, and the East African Revival, History and Legacies, um, which was published in 2016. Emma is also co-editor of the journal Studies in World Christianity, published from Edinburgh. We are indeed honored to have such a distinguished and popular scholar this afternoon, and I welcome her on behalf of all of us. Today, she will speak to us on the topic, Health in World Christianity, Towards 
a history of healing in African Christianity in the 20th century. Before handing over to Emma, a few housekeeping things. As usual, uh, the five doors um, on both sides here. And the lecture will be recorded and will be available on um, CCW YouTube channel. So those who are online, uh, please note that the, the lecture will be recorded. And so thank you. And thank you, Emma, once again. And over to you now. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uttaraj Swami, for your kind words and also your invitation uh, to give this lecture. Um, it's very, very good to be back um, with old friends and to meet some new ones, I hope. Um, and I want to thank you uh, very much for um, bringing me back here to 3CW and the Divinity Faculty. Um, it's very, very nice to be with you. Particular thank thanks to those Scots in the room, and I see a few who are at least postponing their celebration of uh, Robert Burns um, by, by coming here. Uh, and uh, I am missing our uh, School of Divinity uh, Burns Supper this evening to be uh, with you here, but it's a great pleasure. Um, I'm wanting to uh, be, I'm, I'm setting out a project that's really quite ambitious, but as you will see, um, as I go along, I'm, I'm trying to um, focus it down for the purposes of today. But I want you to remember that towards is probably the most important word in the title of my presentation. Uh, because a year ago, I embarked with some trepidation on a new project to consider how to write a modern social history of healing uh, in Christianity in Africa. And I don't need to tell this audience that that scope is large. Um, but also the topic immediately presents significant category questions. What is healing? Uh, who is defining it? Um, where are the reasonable parameters of Christianity? Um, and after 12 months of reading and archival work and field work um, during research leave, um, the, this sense of the challenge of the project has only been confirmed to me. But it hasn't diminished the sense that the project is worthwhile. And so today I'm just exploring um, some ideas. And I know that uh, people in this room will, be ha will have questions and comments afterwards. And I really welcome those as the uh, project continues. I'm working from the assumptions that religious traditions uh, broadly and uh, Christianity, uh, particularly for today, emerge from a desire for wellness and a search for ultimate meaning that engages the supernatural. And quite often this uh, sense of uh, ultimate meaning, search for ultimate meaning, has been a kind of shorthand for religious traditions, but it's something about uh, the way in which I think um, this project um, opens up new avenues, um, that it presents this desire for wellness, for well-being. Uh, sometimes people talk about moral behaviour um, as something that uh, religious traditions also uh, encourage or, 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 or shape. Um, now, the way in which these elements intersect and shift, shape the religious traditions in different ways, uh, over time. And the variety, dynamism and public nature of Christian therapeutic practice in Africa illuminates that process, but it also offers a distinct perspective on broader discussions around scientific or biomedical uh, uh, practices and discussions and also indigenous healing practices. And I'm going to use the term biomedicine throughout basically talking about um, a particular form of scientific endeavor that's based around uh, an acknowledgement of germ theory, of, of understanding diseases um, as sort of microorganisms. Um, and, and the kind of watershed that that was 
uh, in medical history in the way that uh, particularly in the Western world, um, societies began to understand themselves. Of cheering. That works, yes, I'm not quite sure what happened. But, uh, so there are a number of very broad questions um, that, that are kind of framing my inquiry. How did a range of Christian beliefs and practices about healing develop on the African continent in the 20th century? How far do these illuminate the growth of Christian churches and movements, their diversity and their current concerns? And in what ways is our understanding of health informed by centering a study of a wide range of beliefs, practices and institutions that are called Christian? There's an awful lot of work already done in many ways in this area. We have a very lively medical humanities and medical anthropology uh, studies um, and uh, the way in which um, Christianity in, uh, has been studied in the, these have really informed my thinking. But I think perhaps there's a little bit more um, that could be done. Just to give you an, an examples of the kind of scope that um, is include, potentially included, um, there's some kind of sensationalized examples that you might have picked up in the media. Um, last year, um, the Good News International Church in Eastern Kenya um, was reported uh, extensively for a number of weeks. Over a hundred people starved to death as a result of following the teachings of this church. And uh, quite recently, the BBC has produced a doc documentary on TV Joshua of the Synagogue Church of All Nations in Nigeria. And both these, uh, the commentaries around these have tended to focus on the abuse of power of charismatic individuals. Um, but these phenomena are also a part for this search of healing, of wellness, um, and of well-being. My own interest um, was prompted perhaps by uh, less sensational events, um, although uh, as those of us who still remember uh, the shock of the pandemic, perhaps it was equally sen sensational. But um, I've been particularly involved, as uh, Mutaraj said, with a contemporary investigation with colleagues in Congo and with public health experts into the response of faith communities to COVID-19 and to the public health measures that were introduced uh, in DR Congo. And we didn't originally set out to focus on COVID, but uh, the pandemic happened as we had a canteen together. And uh, so we moved to that particular focus. We found uh, that many faith communities were supported for state sanctioned measures to reduce disease spread. <laughs> Others were not, um, and some were ambivalent. But we also identified an instrumentalization of faith communities by government and medical authorities that left many communities under resourced confused and even resentful. And it became clear that the complexity of different forms of healing practices found within the many forms of Christianity in the Democratic Republic of Congo seemed to be ignored as irrelevant in the rush to disease pre prevent prevention and alienated significant groups of people. Now, of course, similar situations played out across the globe. But nevertheless, it seems interesting to trace a wider history that uh, led to this particular situation. So where to start? Um, it seems that starting points matter, uh, particularly for historians who are uh, concerned about periodization and, uh, um, and, and chronologically where to start. And uh, but also, uh, is there a particular group or case study? I think there are a range of possibilities. So for, for today's purposes, I'm going to start with Roman Catholic attitudes to healing in the 1970s to 2000s in Africa. Already a very broad uh, topic. It's not the only place to start. 
But I think it's a productive place to begin, partly because there's a good deal of literature on African initiated and Pentecostal forms of healing practice, and increasingly, not only on its contemporary practice, uh, but also on its history. Think of Joël Cabrita, who's known to many of you here, uh, and her, her book on uh, Zionists in Southern Africa. Also, Adam Moore um, published a book on West African revival, which looks at healing practices. Early Zionists and Aladora healing practices grew more persuasive in the early 20th century as a response to the failure of public health measures when faced with the 1918-19 influenza pandemics. There's also a reasonable amount on Protestant medical missions, uh, Marco Rokainen, uh, Nancy Rose Hunt, Terence Rangers also written it, uh, Walima Kalusa, um, and between them they pointed out things like the contribution of Protestant medical missions to the notion of moral failings that cause disease or exacerbate disease, and also attempts at social reform, particularly child and maternal health and welfare programs. There seems to be less attention to Catholics, although I shall mention Calusa and Barbara Wall again, and Megan Vaughan has also written uh, on, on Catholic uh, organisations. But Catholic material allows debates about healing to emerge within a larger denomination that is present across the African continent, even as those debates take particular regional forms and particular like intra-Catholic uh, forms. And I will touch a little bit on that, but I'm not going to go into it in any depth today. The last 30 years of the 20th century is a period when the rising autonomy of Catholic provinces tested the influence of the Vatican and shifted the regard of <coughs> biomedicine and indigenous healing uh, in new directions. Re-examination of healing knowledge within the Catholic Church, I think, it illuminates the growth of aspects of Catholic practice and shifting concerns at this intersection of faith and health. <clears throat> I'll talk about that and then I'll end with a very, very quick appraisal of sleeping sickness in the 1900s and Catholic responses to that. Just in a, a, a brief attempt to consider a wider context and a uh, historical context and some issues around interpretation and how this uh, issue of periodization affects perhaps how we understand what's going on. The Catholic Church is often associated with a large infrastructure of medical hospitals, clinics, and training institutions that support and are often integral to national ministries of health and their responses uh, in uh, particular countries. Since around 1910, it depends uh, exactly where you are, but the Catholic Church have been establishing hospitals, clinics, and medical training facilities with many small scale dispensaries before that. And obviously this was the work of um, missionary congregations uh, in the first instance. Um, and just to give you a contemporary example, in the responses to COVID-19 in Congo, it was clear and perhaps unsurprising that the Roman Catholic Church made far the largest contribution, although it's quite difficult to get the figures, to the provision of biomedical delivery. And also it possessed national convening power, which um, allowed it to um, draw in uh, uh, members of the government to think about how um, the COVID measures might be rolled out. Um, and along with Caritas International and Caritas Congo, it became an indispensable player in that state response to COVID-19 and indeed has been a partner in other um, epidemics like Ebola and measles and so forth. Um, it, Caritas is, is an important a uh, Catholic development agency, an important player. It has 46 national branches 
uh, on the continent. Um, and there's also a lot of training that's done uh, by Catholic institutions um, and offering including Christian values of service, self-sacrifice, um, and an expectation that spiritual support in some way accompanies biomedical interventions. Um, Catholic medical institutions, systems, are sometimes part of the 43 national Christian medical associations across the continent. Um, some of those are, are largely or entirely Protestant. Um, but if uh, one like Christian Health Association of Malawi, CHAM, uh, the Catholic Church has been a significant player along with um, the Presbyterian and Episcopalian churches. Um, so at, in, in some countries, the Catholic Church is very much uh, at that level, working alongside its Protestant counterparts. Um, and as I mentioned, these, these the legacy of missionary orders that renewed or uh, that we renewed or newly established from the mid 19th century onwards, we see this uh, sort of rising renewal of interest in mission uh, in the mid 19th century. And so from 1840s, but it really starts go getting going in the 1860s, we see new uh, missionary orders like uh, the Missionnaire uh, d'Afrique, the White Fathers, the White Sisters, I'm going to speak about uh, Mill Hill Fathers uh, and others. And this sense, um, very briefly, that the gospel divorced, um, that a gospel divorced, that divorced spiritual matters from healing was unconvincing and uncaring. So these uh, missionary orders introduced scientific approaches uh, of medicine as it developed. Uh, and I'll return to this idea of sort of developing biomedical approaches um, towards the end. The interaction be between colonial and missionary medicine has come under scrutiny um, with studies on the use of vaccination programs or health checks to coerce and control uh, colonial populations, um, and particularly um, as question, around questions surrounding the loss of indigenous healing knowledge. Um, and, but this is a matter that emerges not simply from uh, outside observers, but very strongly within the public Catholic discourse from the 1970s. And it's something of the grappling with that questioning that I want to focus on today. Um, this is, this is uh, Emmanuel uh, Milengo. Um, I, he may be known to some of you or, or by repute um, because he has become something of a, a cause célèbre. Um, in 1983, when he was Archbishop of Lusaka in Zambia, um, he was famously forced to resign from a ministry of exorcism and faith healing that had begun in the 1970s um, and that was not officially sanctioned by the Vatican. From July 1973, four years after becoming Archbishop, Malingo held public healing sessions, uh, allowing people to come uh, into the cathedral um, where he would lay hands on, pray for healing. And this is one of the things um, that he said in a published pamphlet that encouraged this. We have for a very long time suffered from mashawe, often translated witchcraft, and we have had to find the doctors outside our own church. We can heal this disease in our own Catholic church. So if any of you suffer from this disease, let them come forward and we shall try and help them. And he established healing groups from around 1976 um, across the archdiocese. And he did so with the support of the Charismatic Catholic World Congress. Um, and thus, he was associating what was uh, a, 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 a recognized local need, if you like, a regional need, with a global renewalist movement. 
And his healing ministry became so popular that it intruded upon other duties expected of an archbishop. And this became a point of considerable debate within the archdiocese at the time, with people reporting in different ways uh, back to the Vatican. Um, meanwhile, on the ground, more and more people were sorting the links, seeking him out uh, and, and asking him for these uh, prayers of healing. So he was operating at this time as a powerful and charismatic man of God. And that phrase comes up um, regularly uh, in the way that uh, prophets and pastors are, are referred to. He and his supporters understood him to be imbued with healing powers through the Holy Spirit and to be able to respond to sickness and distress in a way that resonated with the divining traditions that were known in Zambia for a long time. But local and international debates about the role of charismatic healing ministries within the Catholic Church and the appropriate uh, role of an archbishop plus accusations of misconduct that, that proved unfounded, all led to Malingo's summons to Rome and his investigation. The sociologist Jerry Teha has known Malingo since the late 80s and has written two books, one, Spirit of Africa, The Healing Ministry of Archbishop Emmanuel Malingo, and most recently, Black Minds Matter, Archbishop Malingo and the Vatican. <clears throat> and she presents Malingo as a radical proponent in the enculturation of Catholicism, um, as well as taking on the Vatican on married priests, but that's, that's another story. Um, she argues that his approach was misunderstood by the Church of Rome because of the Vatican's inherent racism and its diminishing of African thought. Ridiculed for speaking openly about the power of the devil and the ability of prayer alone to heal, Malingo underwent psychiatric assessment to rule out mental illness. And the, this is not the first time that elements of the Catholic Church have raised question, the question of madness uh, in order to silence or to control clergy acting very, very differently from uh, church teaching. But the story of Malingo, the radical bishop, has come to represent in some quarters a kind of assumption that this is the official act attitude of the Catholic Church uh, in Africa vis-a-vis um, -vis healing. That is that the Roman Catholic Church rejects Pentecostal forms of healing. Malingo was no doubt the boldest and the most senior cleric to use forms of charismatic healing that deliberately responded to sicknesses understood to be African and that uh, those that lacked a cure through other forms of health provision. His discipline by the Vatican had a chilling effect, making less radical clerics cautious of proceeding. But nevertheless, that is not the whole story. Um, Paul Gifford in Christianity, Development and Modernity in Africa creates a distinction between development Catholicism with its medical missions and educated spiritual professionals and enchanted Catholicism, a grassroots movement that better represents the African religious imaginations. But Gifford's distinctions rather oversimplify the situation on the ground in which an educated elite is also engaging with a range of practices. Certainly official Catholic positions on the continent and perhaps to some extent now in the Vatican have shifted significantly uh, and certainly had done by the end of the 20th century. So attitudes towards healing became an important part of the theological project to enculturate Christian belief and practicing by examining how long-standing knowledge about health might be brought together with Catholic traditions in a deliberate attempt to um, learn from and engage with uh, long-standing uh, practices uh, on the continent. Initially, though, it, these kind of higher level engagements appear to have avoided addressing the kind of faith healing that Malingo 
conducted, um, although I shall return to where that's gone shortly. Rather, it was the use of herbal medicine and the wisdom of traditional healers that was brought into dialogue with a scientific approach to medication and also to pastoral work. And I'm going to take just a, a few people who speak about this. In Uganda in the year 2000, at a medical conference on cancer, leading Catholic theologian and historian, uh, John Mary Waligo, urged biomedical doctors to appreciate the social, spiritual, and herbal cures found in local cultures. And he said that efforts to reduce the spread and cure of sleeping sickness in the 1900s, which I'll return to in a minute, showed that the disease would only be cured if society involves its deities, ancestors, specialists to offer an acceptable explanation and prescribe the cure. Having outlined his pastoral understanding of responses to disease, he also discussed the importance of family and the ancestors at the point of sickness, asking doctors to better understand their patients and not to so medicalize treatment that the element of community care was eradicated. Waligo well, suggested uh, that over the course of a century, biomedicine had proved useful but inadequate. He advised accommodation with indigenous healing to face the challenges of late 20th century diseases like cancer, which was the topic of the conference, but also HIV, uh, HIV and AIDS and Ebola. Waligo well, was one of a number of priests developing constructive therapeutic theologies. Furthermore, and I think this is uh, important, they were doing so from empirical evidence, observing and interviewing. So we've got some quite early the theologians engaging in eth ethnography uh, in uh, some of these writings. Um, they were addressing not only a, a return to long-standing African practices of healing, but they also began to consider divine or faith healing, at least in their writings. Two examples, the missionary priests Joseph Healy and Donald Seibert's in Towards an African Narrative Theology, in which they very much say, as, as outsiders, we can only write this because we're observing what's going on on the ground and we've done, we've, we've interviewed people and um, so on and so forth. They, they criticized the silencing of Malingo and asserted that the church's fear of healing and exorcism ran counter to the ministry of Jesus. Then they note new initiatives, masses of anointing, laying on of hands or perhaps renewed initiatives might be uh, better. Um, charismatic prayer groups, which they said include freeing people from ancestral possession. From this position, they took a familiar cultural theology approach by considering vernacular names for Jesus that have therapeutic resonances and calling for further portrayals of Jesus as the supreme healer rather than the savior, which they felt was uh, potentially unintelligible. Um, they, they conclude that perhaps healing and casting out devils can be one of the African local churches' main contributions to the world church. The positive African experience, theology and praxis of healing can push and stretch other local churches to investigate <coughs> parallel possibilities in different places in the world. So this, this sense that there is a, a charism, a, a gift, that local churches who are exploring uh, these ways of healing might uh, share with others. And then Laurenti Magesa in Anatomy of Inculturation, Transforming the Church in Africa, takes a similar line as he considers practice around, the, around ritual healing in the Catholic Church. And he also um, lays out in quite uh, detail um, particular instances of Catholics um, being unwell 
and I'm happy and finding no uh, no kind of respite within the Catholic Church and needing to find a way of speaking to their dead in order um, to uh, have that uh, reconciliation. But one of the things he says is rather than, uh, this is a gift uh, from local congregations to the world church, he says the Catholic church must learn from African initiated churches, many of whom, uh, he says, accept modern medicine, but also warn against over-reliance on modern medicine because it may show a lack of faith in the healing power of God through prayer. So these commentaries are coming from uh, theologians but, uh, who are observing popular religious practices and actually carrying out surveys and uh, interviews as well. But it's also coming from uh, uh, several decades of um, experiment with herbal medicine and with some Catholic priests, and I'm not quite sure of the numbers, becoming um, practitioners of traditional medicine themselves. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, Reverend Brother Anatoly Waswa, who died uh, in January last year. And if, you know, a small, a quick Google search will uh, reveal that um, all the major newspapers, <coughs> not simply the Catholic press um, in Uganda, were um, had extensive obituaries uh, because he made such a profound impact uh, on Ugandan society. Um, so in 1981, Massacre Diocesan Dias Synod commissioned research on African traditional culture, behaviours, manners, herbal medicine, taboo practices, diseases, cultural behaviour to harmonise it with Christianity. And as a result, uh, Father Anatoly Waswa trained as a healer at a number of shrines. From 1984, he used his herbal skills at two clinics in Kampala and Mbarara in the Southwest. And having learned the skills and knowledge of certain indigenous healers, Waswa praised those whose traditional cultural expertise healed the sick and prevented disease. He distinguished this practice of healing from those who he accused of causing disharmony through practicing witchcraft, and those who insisted that the use of herbal medicines had to be accompanied by observance of Lubali worship. Lubali is the, the general name for, um, for the deity of the Baganda. So there's a clear uh, um, constructive theology going, going on here, which makes a, a critique of certain uh, practitioners. Um, and this critique is, is brought into the public sphere by taking on some of the uh, those he felt were practicing antisocial, harmful uh, medicine. Um, and, but he's using his experience to delineate categories that support a Catholic use of herbal medicine for a range of ailments, um, and, and one that can appreciate long-standing cultural practice. He is rejecting the, the cosmologies that had undergirded much of herbal medicine's use as a traditional practice. Um, and he was, uh, this constructive theology was an attempt to, in his words, to distinguish between genuine culture that could be celebrated by Christianity on one hand and witchcraft or paganism that was antisocial and to be eradicated on the other. So, um, in, in his book, Unveiling Witchcraft, he explores uh, herbal medicine, um, but it's also a polemic against uh, these antisocial intentions as he identifies them or behaviors, which inserted practices deemed to be therapeutic. Um, he, and he said, true Ugandan religion and culture is very close to Christianity. Witch doctors are responsible for later deviations. Um, it includes, his book includes an account of actions to expose witch doctors as charlatans or evildoers and to persuade them that their profession had lost its way because of these harmful practices. 
and it effectively resets long-standing herbal knowledge and divination practices, placing them within this Catholic framework. Um, and interestingly, um, this includes a revival of the use of exorcism as a church practice, which significantly opens up a discussion into evil spirits and so forth. So he perhaps begins to, uh, in this, this book um, in uh, 2007, pushes a bit further than um, some slightly earlier writers um, seem willing to do. So there's an intent to blend what was perhaps the best of both worlds, not to be a simple return to the past. And what's what influenced a generation of priests, um, if you look um, not only at his, um, his clinics, but um, it, the, the, you can see uh, he's supervised or given advice on quite a number of dissertations at two of the seminaries in Kampala. His name's right the way through them. Um, but also there were other data gathering uh, projects on herbal medicine hosted by the Catholic Church. And I, I want to find out more about these. Um, but I, I certainly remember one of them when I was living in DR Congo uh, in the 1990s. Uh, in which um, it's what we call stakeholders uh, from different uh, groups were brought together um, to learn uh, from traditional healers. Uh, and that included that, you know, Protestant churches were invited to the table. Um, and in endorsing this approach, the Catholic Church has been somewhat bolder than other mission initiated churches. Um, but, and I think it's important to remember before we talk about divine healing that this synthetic approach of Waswa is distinct from most Pentecostal churches that propound faith healing while strongly criticizing indigenous religious and healing practices connected with herbal medicine uh, and with any form of engagement with ancestors or divining. So there is, uh, in a sort of marketplace, there, there are quite distinct ways of approaching um, these healing practices coming from uh, different uh, churches or denominations. So this position of finding an efficacious synthesis of biomedicine and traditional healing practice um, fits quite nicely with the aim of a number of national bodies um, that regula regulate and systematize the work of healers. And uh, a lot of these um, projects were instigated uh, in the early independence era, but they've had a kind of imprimatur more broadly from the WHO, who looked into creating practices, uh, you know, ethical codes of conduct for indigenous healers and so forth. Uh, and at the end of his life, in fact, it comes up in the obituaries, um, the Uganda Natural uh, Chemico Therapeutics Research Institute um, were, was preparing to carry out clinical trials on Waswa's medicines. So this synthesis was not necessarily a synthesis of um, Waswa carrying out scientific research on his uh, medicines, but rather saying, you can come to me or you can go to the hospital, see what works, what are you suffering from? Uh, is it something that um, the, the local clinic can easily diagnose, or is it something that you need my kind of care for? So you know they were kind of running alongside each other, but there was a sense that that was that was okay. But there are these research institutes that are, that are doing this kind of research, looking at um, herbal treatments. But I want to just very briefly, and um, there's a good deal more that could be said, um, address this, uh, the idea of healing prayers, faith healing or divine healing, um, this, this approach that Malingo used um, that was so roundly condemned by the Vatican. As Magissa indicated in his book, the shift is encouraged by the rise in Pentecostal churches and ministries and, and African initiated churches, earlier generation of churches, and a re-examination of Catholic practices like laying on of hands, anointing with oil and exorcism. 
And this has brought about a number of shrines which have had a role in pilgrimage, healing and confession since early missionaries established Marian shrines. And some of them have become sites for charismatic practice. Uh, just to give you two examples, the Eucharistic Shrine Mount Zion Prayer Centre, Bukalango, um, has prayers for healing, most particularly uh, for the sins of the ancestors, which cause mental and physical suffering for uh, their uh, descendants. And these prayers can be offered under the oversight of Monsignor Magambe. The Apostle of Jesus Shrine of the Sacred Heart in Nairobi tackles a range of human suffering in a similar way. So since Archbishop Malingo's ministry, charismatic practices have spread throughout the continent since the 1970s, and now gain in some areas at least the imprimatur of Episcopal oversight. A change um, that gives both validation to the practices, but also control over shrines. Um, and uh, Richard Vokes has, has written on uh, millennial charismatic uh, groups um, that were po possibly uh, involved in this kind of practice, um, but had no oversight, were rather shunned by the church. And I think we have a, at least some sense of um, <coughs> authorities wanting to ensure that they kind of know what's going on. Uh, here, as well as accepting um, it, the importance of this form um, of healing. So by the end of the 20th century, a more conciliatory approach to faith healing was developing in parts of the Catholic Church in Africa, um, but divine healing remains controversial. Uh, but for many, and, and, and you know, that there has been uh, waxes and wanes in uh, who, who is uh, teaching for those dissertations of Waswa that came right up to the end of the uh, 20th century. When you see the, the dissertations that have come through in the last 20 years, they have been much more ecclesial, they've been much more focused on uh, internal practice, um, which I think perhaps suggests a shift, at least in Uganda, about who's teaching and what they're teaching. Um, but nevertheless, um, this divine healing is viewed by many Catholics as a, a, as a contextual response to the spiritual practices of African peoples and a way of um, seeking that well-being and that understanding of ultimate meaning. Um, I'd like to end what I'm going to say by considering how to interpret these shifts in Catholic practice. And in, in some ways, I'm returning to my question about where to start. In the late 20th century, as my examples have shown, Catholic provision was part of a post-colonial shift in biomedicine that incorporated public health and traditional healing in its repertoires as it supported the agendas of independent African nation states. This is not something that is unique um, to uh, the Catholic Church. Um, it, it's echoed in, in what nations are, uh, the direction that nations are taking. Internally, there was a debate about the role of indigenous knowledge in modern healing practices. And while Lima Kalusa studied of Catholic missions in Zambia from 1964, argues that the cultural destruction of the imperial past was redeemed in the independence era by a move to a wider conception of health and an indigenization of personnel. Barbara Wall echoes this view in a study of women religious in West Africa. In the 1970s, she says, nuns offering health care moved from holding a position of what she calls unparalleled optimism in medicine and science to an incorporation of indigenous practices, particularly in maternal health. The inference of Calusa and Wall is that medical missions can be somehow judged by how far they respond to the improvements taking place in biomedicine and also how they undo practices now deemed damaging. 
And biomedicine, I think, in these readings is a structure of power or knowledge that is to be criticized and deconstructed and altered in favor of indigenous knowledge and techniques. And these studies certainly resonate with wider assumptions, uh, some of which I mentioned at the beginning. Western missionaries brought with them medical technologies that were emerging in Europe and North America. Based on scientific procedures and post-enlightenment thought, they categorized and divided human activity, prioritized medical interventions for individual physical cures of the human body, whilst developing inquiries into mental health and preventative public health. Missionaries contributed to the discovery of new techniques of medicine in the field of tropical medicine that uh, certainly kept them alive for longer, but they encouraged local people to adopt these methods, insisting that these techniques were but a modern way of following Jesus the great healer. This historical reading is framed by what Hokkainen and Kananoja call the apparatus of biomedicine triumphant. And my focus today, up until this point, would appear to endorse this in interpretation. But I wonder if it does not fully account for the Christian beliefs and practices that infuse medical care and does not fully regard historic changes in biomedical care. And this is why I, I kind of want to go back to the early part. So instead of seeing this sort of one trajectory, to think about some other things. To raise these questions, we need to return to the Catholic mission responses at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, I think we could go further back than that, but we won't do today. Um, interestingly, Waligo referred to the sleeping sickness epidemic of the 1900s as an historic example that would encourage the, wide, the use of the wide range of healthcare responses that he proposed. Um, sleeping sickness is human African trypanosomiosis. It's a parasitic disease and it's transmitted by infected tsetse flies. And it was first identified as a distinct illness with its own etiology in 1901 around the shores of Lake Victoria, when about a quarter of a million people died of the disease. Now, studies uh, have focused on the devastating impact of the disease and the way that that was exacerbated by colonial intrusion uh, and the way that an attempt to remedy it was encouraged, encouraged the development of tropical medicine under colonial control, including uh, a prominent role for Dr. Albert Cook of the Church Missionary Society. They were also noted that uh, Dr. H. H. Robert Koch, associated with being kind of the father of germ theory and biomedicine, along with Louis Pasteur, and spent much of 1906 in East Africa attempting to find a cure. So Waligo's comment that uh, sleeping sickness um, was 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 a kind of a uh, you know the, the response to sleeping sickness was somehow a, a model for a century later on the surface seems rather surprising but Waligo really did know his history so um, I think there's uh, something to attend to um, he may refer to the experimental nature of the response. And there is a, at least one study that talks about what the Ugandan responses were as far as we can understand them. And certainly the regents um, for King Daudi Chua encouraged long-standing disease control methods to try and reduce the spread of sleeping sickness. Uh, and there was certainly there's certainly evidence of substantial experimentation there. There was also colonial authorities move populations from transmission sites, which was a hugely disruptive operation. Whereas Koch recommended a toxil, a drug that despite its name, not poisonous, um, proved to be almost as deadly as the disease. And Terence Ranger has regarded this epidemic and the rinderpest, uh, which decimated cattle around the same time, as evidence that when diseases emerge for the first time or become epidemic, 
healing expertise and explanatory systems are often found to be inadequate and new ones are sought. Certainly, Waligo in this comment uh, would be aware of the responses of Catholic missionaries, uh, and I want to bring them in the frame. Um, they didn't have the clout uh, in, at this time that the CMS mission had in terms of medical provision, uh, but they did have a dispensary at each station, and in some ways, because of that, were much uh, more closely engaged both with um, uh, small scale remedies, that's what they call them, remedies, um, and with um, other healers that are about the place, both in a competitive way and in a kind of um, alongside way. So we do see um, that, uh, um, that, they, that, that, indig that um, people are coming to the White Fathers uh, as, an as an alternative to indigenous practitioners, sometimes before, sometimes afterwards, but seeing them in this sort of range of, of options when something goes wrong. Um, but when it came to sleeping sickness, their, their limited expertise was completely surpassed. They, from, from their diaries, um, or published uh, diaries, they were horrified uh, by its tragedy and felt absolutely helpless as they watched it unfold. But interestingly, they criticised the mass evictions order, order, uh, ordered by the British colonial authorities, although they had to comply with them. Um, and they actually wanted, they were really putting their money on cock and this biomedical, uh, this medicine that would cure uh, the body. Um, and as far as you can see in the published diaries, the White Fathers and the White Sisters, who were actually doing a lot of the uh, care, moved significantly towards biomedical options during the pandemic, hoping that Cox medicine would work. And I think this maybe is a significant moment when, when um, the, the White Fathers started in the 1860s, uh, uh, Charles Lavingari insisted that there be a medical component to their work. And there was a, actually quite a lot of internal debate. People thinking, well, what's the point? Uh, this is not our, our, main, our main purpose. And, and you see a kind of steady shift uh, over this 40 year period. Um, but I think with sleeping sickness, there's a kind of like what we've been offering is inadequate. We've got to look for something else. So again, they, they are rethinking um, what's going on. Um, but we have to remember, and this audience will be unsurprised uh, to hear, that there's also a, a very different approach to, to healing. Um, the White Father's primary understanding of healing was that it was a spiritual process which culminated in baptism and ensured eternal life. Um, and the Marian devotion uh, through prayers at shrines was part of uh, this uh, kind of spiritual path which uh, enabled, um, uh, enabled healing to take effect. So they were concerned about uh, the, the healing of the individual body and medicine, and but their primary understanding was um, a, a spiritual one. And so what they offered uh, during the sleeping sickness epidemic was palliative care, and this is not particularly unusual. They established one hospital every year, 1901, 1902, 1904, and then two in 1905. And I have a slide here, which some people may find rather hard to look at, um, uh, particularly since it's a, a postcard that white fathers were using, I think, to uh, gain support. Um, and, you know, there's a lot that we can learn about this. The white fathers clearly felt helpless. They had wanted to offer their remedies as something that was superior to traditional healing in order to convince people that the real healing of the soul was the thing they should be after. But in these postcards, they're also portraying 
uh, African people as sick and helpless uh, and unable to look after themselves. Um, so there, there's 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 a lot um, going on um, in in this story. But I think there are two points that I would like to bring out as I uh, come to an end. Um, it was the inadequacy of European missionaries' basic remedies that encouraged increased attention to scientific medical inquiry in the early 20th century. Whilst from the 1970s, it was the frustration at the inadequacy of biomedicine that prom pr promoted African priests to place more faith in local knowledge. Um, and then the other thing for the white fathers in the 1900s and the African priests from 1970s, the understanding of healing remains spiritual as well as physical. And I think this is something that is uh, often overlooked in, in some of the histories around this period. It's acknowledged that these are religious people, but, but actually understanding how that's operative, um, I think is, is key. Um, the biomedical view only ever complemented Catholic practices rather than superseding them. And so the biomedical and the indigenous views um, then were coming together to continue to complement that Catholic practice towards the end of the century. So to, to conclude, um, in the course of a century, Catholic missionary organizations and institutions substantially shifted their attitudes to healing. And as I said, I am very well aware that I'm using Catholic to bring together a whole host, um, but I hope you can see that there is, there is debate and controversy within this, even if I haven't had to go, go into the, the detail. But the process was not simply from biomedicine to a willingness to countenance herbal medicine and divine medicine along with it. Rather, the spiritual nature of healing, the explanations of Catholic for death and life, uh, interact with the various responses of the church to those practices. So I think there are a number of trails to explore rather than a single route of this biomedicine triumphant to biomedicine revisited or critiqued. Um, and I think as I go forward, my tentative attempt to consider the Christian in these healing processes is this attempt to investigate how longer histories of spiritual practices surround healing and inform the critique of biomedicine, including indigenous African knowledge and Catholic practices and how these discourses and practices surrounding healing and Christianity are intertwined. So I'm hoping that this particular start that I've presented today is at least going to offer us a sort of springboard for, for further discussion. I'm very much looking forward to your comments.